Hi everybody, this is T. Falcon Napier. Welcome to the Oracle of the Self. Today is the discovery session for Exploration 6, which is on the subject of managing myself. Joining me on today's call are several members of our ChangeWorks community, which you can learn more about on our Patreon page. Today, we'll be walking through the 12 mission critical activities we've chosen for the ChangeWorks self-assessment we've developed specifically for this exploration. You'll find the link to complete the free profile in the description block found below this video. So do complete the profile as soon as you've finished watching this video, you'll receive your results immediately. And then you can gain insights into your results by watching the interpretation videos at the links you'll also find in the description block below. As always, please like our video, subscribe to our channel, and share the links with everyone you know. We certainly appreciate your support. So let's dive in. Now, whether you are clicking on the link below this video, or you may have received something in an email, once you click on that link, you're going to be taken to a screen that looks just like the one you're looking at right now. So hopefully you guys on the call can all see the screen. Yep. Yep. Yes. So um, we ask you to put in your respondent information. And as I've said before, and I'll say over and over again, you are more than welcome to put in a fake name. We are not using this to build any kind of a database. We don't collect the data for any purposes whatsoever. So you feel free to create whatever name you want to create. Personally, my alter ego is a guy by the name of Ferd Burfel. And so my first name is Ferd. My last name is Burfel. You can put in anything you want. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter us at all. That said, we do need to have the right email address because the system is going to automatically send you your ChangeWorks results. And so please make sure your email address is correct. When it comes to the phone number, you can put in anything you want because I promise you, no one is ever going to call you. 654, wait, 987654. 3210. Put in any number you want. No one cares. Choose a time zone that you find interesting. Personally, I thought I'd go to Iwinitakwajal line, wherever that is. Uh, and when it comes to accepting the terms, I do want you to know you could click on the word terms. You'll find a very short uh, a number of paragraphs that just says, we're not using data for any reason whatsoever. The only thing the system does is it takes your input and creates an output and sends you the output. Uh, we can then com combine all that output into a single result that we can look at as we work our way through the debrief. And so the terms aren't, aren't anything really to be concerned about, but you're welcome to read them um, and know what we're all about. So but, uh, there you go. So, and when you do that, you then click on uh, continue to the change grid. Anyone have any questions, comments about filling out uh, the basics for uh, you to be able to uh, get your change work results? No? Yeah. All right. So you just click on continue to the change grid and you'll find some instructions. We do encourage you to read these uh, instructions and really um, bask for a minute or two into what these instructions are actually telling you to do. They are pretty straightforward, but nevertheless, we wanna make sure you know what you're doing before you start filling it out. Um, now, we've put together this list of 12 activities and on the um, discovery call, what we like to do is work our way through each one of these activities. As we work our way through each activity, I'm going to go ahead and complete my, my you know, I'll give you my actual results or I'll, I'll put in my, my actual assessments, uh, just so you can kind of see the process as we work our way through it. Okay, so this life situation we're looking at is about managing myself, managing yourself, as the case may be. And it's going to look a lot into um, aspects of time and energy management. And so um, I think that ultimately, what's really going to make or break the success that you're going to have in achieving whatever goals you want to achieve is tied very much to your ability to monitor and manage your time and your energy. And so let's kind of jump into the activity list and you can see how it all maps out. So activity number one, identifying my core goals to focus my efforts on what matters most. Now. 
you can uh, think about any particular area of life you want to. Uh, you can think about a specific goal if that's something that works well for you. But the bottom line is you need to identify what are these core goals that you are uh, thinking about focusing your efforts towards. So that has to be something that really matters. And so identifying your core goals. Now, when I think about identifying my core goals, um, I, I, I start to look at each one of these four dimensions that we um, actually evaluate as we come up with our change works results. And the first one is size. How big of a job do you think identifying your core, core goals are to focus your efforts on? Um, I don't think it's a particularly big task, and as the case with all four of these dimensions, lower numbers mean it's, in this case, smaller. And the bigger the number, the bigger the task. And when we think about the size of a task, we're really thinking about resource consumption. How much time is it going to take to do this task? How much energy is it going to take to do these tasks? How many resources is it going to consume? Well, when it comes to identifying my core goals to focus my efforts on what matters most, I'm going to say that the size of that task is probably a two. It's just not a very big task. It's something you can pretty much do in your head. Maybe you're going to write them down. That's completely up to you, but it's not a very big, big task. Now, when it comes to the ability to identify my core goals, Ability also ranges from a low of zero to a high of 12. If I give myself a zero for that, I'm saying I've got no ability to do this whatsoever. I've got no knowledge, no skill, no experience, no nothing. I'm clueless when it comes to identifying my core, my core goals. The higher the number, the higher the ability. And so if you gave yourself a 12, you'd say that you're an absolute master when it comes to identifying your core goals. And so for me, where I'm at right now, I'm going to say that identifying my core goals is probably about, uh, my ability to do that is probably about a six. Honestly, I'm going through a little bit of a, a period of transition. I'm feeling a little bit of upheaval. Um, I don't really know what I want to be doing at this particular stage in life, et cetera. And so my ability to do that well right now, um, I'm going to give it a six, just a moderate kind of an answer. The challenge for identifying those, those core goals is the next dimension. It too ranges from a low of zero to a high of 12. To give yourself a zero for challenge would mean that you consider the tasks to be absolutely effortless. Um, to give yourself a 12 means the task is impossible. So when I think about how challenging it is to identify my core goals, at this point in time, my mind is kind of going like, you know, that's, that's pretty challenging for me right now. So I'm going to give it a nine um, on the challenge scale. How important is it? Um, it's important. Obviously, it's something that I need to do if I really want to get, uh, you know, progress made in my life, the most out of my life. And so I'm going to say that identifying those core goals is at least an 11. I'm hesitant to give anything to 12, but that's what I would say are my, um, my assess, my self-assessment on this particular activity. So does anyone on the call have anyone, any questions, comments, thoughts about identifying so the core goals? Yeah, David. So from a coaching standpoint, it seems like we need to raise your ability. Well, and that would certainly be the case when we start talking about action planning, looking at the results and how to get ourselves moved from where we are to where we should ideally be. We're going to be looking at all sorts of different maneuvers that we might put into place to change grid right. maneuvers to do that. So, um, so, but your observation is absolutely spot on. So I don't really uh, have a strong ability at this point in time to identify those core goals. And I guess this gives us an opportunity to also remind everyone that um, having the ability to do something um, does not stay unchanged forever. Your ability to do something on one day around one situation, one subject could be very different than your, your perceived ability to do it on a different day or with a different subject. And so right now is the only moment we really want to be looking at. This is the moment in which we can actually uh, better understand what's going on so we can do the right thing starting from where we are right now. 
And for whatever reasons, I'm just not feeling like I've got a whole lot of ability to do this right now. It's feeling pretty tough. So six for ability and nine for challenge. Um, yeah, other thoughts about that, David, or anybody else on the call? Well, I, I certainly uh, want to know what was going on in your life right now that maybe impacted your ability. Right. And again, this is something when we work our way through the debrief, we're going to want to do that in detail, because that's a real question for me to be asking myself. Again, this is the oracle of the self. And so if I'm going to be giving myself an ability of a six, where at other times I might have given my ability a 10 or an 11 or a 12 even to identify my core goals, um, then something is happening right now. And that's why I think I'm encouraging everyone who's filling out the ChangeWorks profile, just be in the moment. Give your, your, uh, your, yourself the permission to be open, honest, candid about how you are actually perceiving your ability, the challenge, the importance, et cetera, at this particular moment in time regarding this particular activity. So Brian, what would you like to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to say, this is an interesting one for me, because when I think about core goals, particularly, there are some immediate things in terms of just being grounded in the moment, or, you know, in a situation that would at least provide some momentum towards the long term. So I always see from those two perspectives, and, mm -hmm. and then that the, the task at hand, if you will, becomes how do I reconcile the gap in between. And so it provides a intentional focus in terms of managing energy. Because a lot of times as I do a review at the end of the year, I can see time was wasted, not only time, but energy was wasted on projects or different things that not only did it not yield the result uh, that I wanted an outcome, but it wasn't what I should have been focused on in the, in the first place. Well, that's a wonderful <laughs> observation because, you know, ultimately as we work our way through these 12, we're going to look at like a, a full uh, package of how to go about really achieving those goals that matter most to you. But it all starts with identifying what those goals are. And mm -hmm. so sometimes in certain situations in life, the goals are assigned to you. For example, if you're looking at something that's uh, work related, sometimes those are goals that other people are uh, suggesting for you, perhaps quite aggressively suggesting for you. So perhaps there's some, um, some uh, health issues that you're dealing with and your, uh, your medical team is encouraging you to do things, if not giving you the what for about getting some of your behaviors um, um, uh, put, you know, get back online. So, uh, so it's always going to change, but it begins by, by really understanding what are your core goals uh, to help focus your, your efforts on what matters most. Now, you move on to the second activity, and that's planning my day in advance to prioritize tasks and allocate sufficient time for each one of those. Obviously, these goals have to be translated into some sort of action, and we have to make room in our life for those actions to even happen. To have nothing but a list of core goals, but never really do anything for them is rather pointless. So when I think about planning my day in advance to prioritize tasks and allocate sufficient time for each of those goals, um, I'm going to say the size of that task, again, how much time is it going to take, how much energy, what are the resources? I'm going to say that's not to be trifled with, but it's hardly something that's going to occupy all my time and all my energy in a day. So maybe I'll give that one a four. My ability to plan my day in advance, I think is really quite high. I have the ability to plan my day, um, to make those prioritizations, to make sure that I've got the right time in there. So do I have the ability? Absolutely. I'm hardly perfect at anything. So I'll give myself a solid 10 for my ability to do that. The challenge of planning my day in advance um, is not something that can be, um, you know, um, just assumed uh, to be in place. There's more challenge to it than I think people really allow. So planning your day in advance, I'm going to say the challenge for me doing that is probably um, maybe an eight or a nine. I'll give myself a nine for that. And the importance, I think the importance is also very high. So I'll give myself uh, probably a, a, another 11 for that one. 
How about you guys? What thoughts do you have around this activity of planning your day in advance to prioritize those tasks and allocate the time that each one needs? Thoughts around that? Tom, yeah, I, let, me, let, me, let me throw it to Tom first. Challenge always impacts ability. Like in a vacuum, my ability is an 11. Yeah. But when I'm experiencing a lot of challenges and you see activity one and two are related. If you're not sure what your core goals are, how motivated are you to plan a tomorrow? Right, 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 right. And it's interesting, uh, for this is for everyone who's uh, watching this video and filling out the ChangeWorks profile. Um, keep in mind that when we ask you to uh, rate four different perceptions you have about a particular activity, we're doing something that's very artificial. In, in truth, your brain doesn't make a distinction uh, among these four and probably another 40 that might be involved. So it's absolutely true that your perception of the size of something may impact your perception perception of other uh, of these uh, variables that we're looking at. Certainly, the more challenging something becomes, the more you're going to question your ability to do it, or the less ability you have, the more challenging you might think the activity is. So, well, that's absolutely true. What we'd like you to do is you think about ability versus challenge is this. Think the, of ability as being about all of the concrete things that are involved in performing this particular task. So concrete things are, are measurable and testable and provable. They are elements of knowledge and skill and experience. So these are the things you have. These are the things that you've already accumulated, you've already accomplished, whatever. And so this stuff tends to be much more measurable uh, than per perceived challenge. Now, perceived challenge is the opposite. It's made up of all that stuff that isn't directly measurable. It's more abstract, where, where ability is more concrete. So when we think about the perceived challenge of doing something, this is where elements of confidence are going to come into play, um, elements of, of um, just feeling as though you're ready to do it, that there's a reason for doing it. So challenge is made up of a lot of other variables that are most definitely coming into play, but do not necessarily affect your actual ability, but they could still affect your perceived ability to do something. So whatever degree you can, we would encourage you to let your ability rating uh, focus on those concrete elements of it and the challenge rating as a way of simply expressing how you're feeling about it, what your hunches, intuitions, all those internal dialogues that you might be having with yourself around it. Uh, yeah, uh, thoughts about that, uh, uh, Tom? No, I, I, I totally understand and agree just when I'm filling it out. I yep. have it. Uh, planning my day in advance, my ability, and I don't rate myself 12, but it's 12. If you said the only thing you have to do in life is put 20 minutes to plan the following day, I could succeed. Yep. But then when I start not following through on any of the plan, my motivation affects my perceived ability. That's all I was saying. And there you are. There you are. And see, and that's why, look at the next activity. Sticking to my plan to ensure progress in reaching my goals. Having a goal is one thing, putting the goal onto your schedule is another thing, and then sticking to that schedule, sticking to that plan is yet another thing. And so as we work our way through the activity list, you'll feel us walking through a very, I guess, kind of uh, practical kind of a way of, uh, you know, moving through the different steps involved in achieving success in any kind of a given sort of goal. And so you're absolutely right. My challenge may very well be, I just don't know that I could stick with it. Or maybe in my past, I've put together plenty of plans, but haven't stuck with as many of them as perhaps I should have. And that does, in fact, make it more challenging. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's go on to the next one. So, yeah, sticking to my plan to ensure progress in reaching my goals. So how big of a task does it feel like it is to stick to my plan? Well, I don't mind sharing with you that that 
in where I'm at right now, and again, the change grid is always looking at a psychological moment in time. This isn't a personality test. This is just a mirror that's reflecting where your mind is, what conversations you're having with yourself about these. And right now, sticking to that plan to me feels like just a gigantic expectation to put on myself. It really feels quite overwhelming. Now, don't let that sway your own assessments. I'm just giving you as as honest an answer as I can to where I'm at right now with this managing myself kind of an activity. So just because I created a tool doesn't mean I'm immune <laughs> from all of the things it might reveal. You know, I, 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 you know, I use this. So it really feels like a gigantic task. My ability to stick to my plan I wish I could say it was really high, but if I own my my you know my my, my truth, I would say that sticking to my plan, um, maybe it's a three, maybe it's a four, and the challenge of doing it is really high. I'm going to give it maybe an eleven. Sometimes it even feels like a twelve. Um, and the importance of sticking to my plan, mm, if I speak my truth. I'm going to say it might be a four. So now a lot of you that are on the call, a great uh, percentage of the people who are part of the ChangeWorks community are human development professionals. And I know that every one of you that's on this call right now are listening to me give you give uh, myself these ratings. And I have to believe that it's triggering all kinds of thoughts. Uh, that you guys uh, uh, might be sharing with me if I was your client or if we were in one of those uh, kinds of a coaching sort of a situation. So let me throw that to you guys. Feel free, open up, share what you want to share. Are you guys concerned about me based on the answers I just gave for my yes. and the challenge? All right, tell yes. me a bit about that. What, what, I, what, would want, I, I would want to go back to uh, activity number two and focus on that for a little while, saying, you know, obviously planning your day is, is uh, uh, important to you, but sticking with it is not. So let's look at the way you're planning your day and see if we can make some modifications to that to make it easier for you to stick to it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. Good, good, good. What other observations might you guys have about uh, this rating set I've just given myself? Anybody? All right. Well, I'll well, throw some. Obviously, your ability is very low. It, well, my perceived ability is very low. It may right, very well right. be, you know, historically, I've done a great deal in my life, but and I stuck to plenty of plan. For whatever reason, right now, I just don't really, I'm, not, I'm just not feeling it. Um, and I think it may actually go all the way back to num activity number one. Number one. I, I was going to suggest that because it seemed like as I scanned the list, something that Tom said uh, triggered my thinking in terms of the difference between what I call acquisition behaviors, meaning being, mindset, those kinds of things, and then application when it comes time to actual, actually do something about it or actualize them in real time where you have to like apply different expression. Those are uniquely different in terms of their energetic uh, output. And so sometimes when there's unknown variables and if the outcome is too far apart, it's kind of yep. like health, right? When we're asking people to take a lifetime commitment to health. Well, that's so far apart that is is it's difficult to manage that daily in terms of, oh, well, this is nutritionally of value for me. Uh, you know, moving my body, these things that have major consequences but sticking to them every day against other competing priorities, that yep. makes it that much more difficult. It certainly can. It certainly can. And again, for, for everyone who's watching this video, this is the kind of dialogue that we hope you benefit from hearing by uh, doing these calls with our ChangeWorks uh, professionals and with members of our ChangeWorks community, because these are probably the same thoughts that are happening in your own head as you're working your way through this. Just the act of filling out a change group in and of itself is a developmental 
mental experience. In all likelihood, most of you listening to, uh, to this uh, recording or watching this video have never stopped to do many of these things ever. And so we're asking you to, to say, no, when it comes to managing yourself, here are 12 mission critical activities. So as you start to think about each one of these activities and assess yourself as far as readiness to be able to do these things, you are going to really start thinking about uh, this life situation in perhaps greater detail than you've ever thought about it before. Now, when you see the results, you'll get even greater insights, but just the act of filling out a change grid is a very valuable developmental experience uh, for you guys to, uh, to, to all have. So hopefully, you're doing that. Uh, one thing I will throw out is that I would really much wonder if the reason why it's uh, I have such a low ability and it's so challenging to stick to my plan is because this goal I've identified isn't even really my goal. Maybe the bottom line is that I've got that goal because someone told me I should have it or whatever, but the bottom line is I, it's not mine. It's not mine. And so I think there's a lot being revealed to yourself as you start to work your way through this or any of the activity lists we put together for any of the life situations we take a, a greater look at. Uh, thoughts about that before we move on to the next activity? All right. So now let's assume you're in a much healthier space than I am about that one. Uh, but the next activity is that you need to be able to enforce non-negotiable boundaries to protect your time and your personal well-being, your time and your energy. So you got to stick to your plan, but sometimes sticking to your plan is going to be impacted by other things happening outside of you. Like Brian just said, life's going to keep on happening. So other things are going to change. There's going to be priorities that are going to impose them. Can you uh, enforce these boundaries to protect yourself? Uh, we all live in a real world. There are sometimes things are going to pop up that you really do need to focus on and take care of. But there are other times when things come along that are interfering with your ability to stick to that plan. And in those situations, are you able to enforce those boundaries to protect your time and your personal well-being? or do you leave yourself at the mercy of uh, other situations, other uh, requests, other things that pop up? So when I think about enforcing non-negotiable boundaries, I would say to you that that task for me is uh, it's of moderate size because I have so many opportunities around me and other things I could be doing. My ability to enforce those boundaries is very high. Um, and so I'm going to give myself an 11. Again, I'm always hesitant to give myself a 12 for anything. There's always room uh, for, for growth or room for more. The challenge of enforcing those boundaries to me is not particularly all that difficult. Um, I am someone who, uh, as you'll learn later on that, uh, down the list, can you say no to things? I'm pretty good at saying no to things. And for me, the importance of having those non-negotiable boundaries when it comes to managing your own time, your energy, your mental state, all these other things that fall into the category of energy, the importance of doing it to me is extremely high. And so I'm going to give that one a 12. So uh, that's it, but enforcing non-negotiable boundaries to protect my time and my personal well-being. Uh, thoughts about this one, anyone? And let me throw out one thing. Before you can enforce them, you have to have them. So those of you that are really thinking about these boundaries or find yourself having some challenge in doing it, maybe just maybe it's because you don't have those boundaries in place yet and you haven't verbalized those boundaries to others uh, in whatever way, whatever form that takes. You know, you can't expect people to respect your boundaries if you've never told them what your boundaries are. And you certainly can't tell them what your boundaries are if you've never even decided what your boundaries may be. And so I think one of the things we would really be, uh, hope you guys would be working on for yourself as uh, students of, of, uh, of ChangeWorks is recognizing the importance of boundaries and ultimately the importance of living those boundaries, enforcing those boundaries. Okay, so I could be doing uh, number three really, really well, sticking to my plan. But if uh, people come along that want to move me out of my boundaries or things arise that move me out of my boundaries, how good am I at enforcing my boundaries? 
Okay. Activity number five, monitoring my physical and mental states to keep my performance at its peak. So this is really about you paying attention to what's happening with you physically. So you've got the, the energy, physical energy that you need to even have a productive sort of a day. And your mental state, are you in the right mindset? Um, are there other things that are going on that may very well be distracting you from that? So I got to be able to monitor my physical and mental states. The size of this task is moderate. It does require some, um, so for me, again, this is just my answers. These are not answers that you guys need to say, oh, that's the right answer. The only correct answer is your own genuine answer to the thing. But when I th I'm, I'm going to say, well, that's about a six. I'm someone who really does need to think about what's going on with my body, what's going on with my mind. Um, and I, I need to make this part of my normal routine, part of my practice around my mindfulness or whatever I might be doing. My ability to monitor my physical state is really quite high. I'm very good at knowing when I'm off track physically, when I'm off track emotionally. So I'm going to give my ability a nice solid 10. Maybe just maybe there's ways I could be doing it even better. So I'm going to leave myself some wiggle room there. The challenge of monitoring my physical and mental state is really not all that high for me. Uh, for whatever reason, because I am kind of more tuned in to what's going on with my body and with my mind, the challenge is a bit low. Um, in fact, it's something that starts to feel a little bit, um, what do I say, routine for me. And so I'm going to give the challenge maybe a four for that. And the importance of doing it, can't deny it, it's an important thing. I'm going to give it a an 11, tempted to give it a 12, but I'll give it an 11 uh, for, uh, for, for that. Um, thoughts anyone like, would like to share about activity number five, monitoring my physical and mental states? Anyone? All right, so Brian, you're, a, you're the physician on there. Why is it important, do you think, for people to monitor their physical and mental states? Well, you know, again, we always talk about this idea of uh, internal states, interoception, and how it's looking to balance things from a homeostatic perspective and exterioception or external states. Sometimes people are so focused um, externally that they're being externally driven instead of internally led, which means they're going to be imbalanced. So dysregulation happens when the afferent neurons, the ones going up into the body so the sensory going up into the brain is not regulating or interacting effectively with efferent neurons so your capacity to think about things and reason so when you're in amygdala hijacked state and like you're too overwhelmed by emotions or you're too caught up in it you're not controlling that then you're not thinking reasonably and your productivity is going to plummet or you're going to compromise quality in some kind of activity so it's very important to be able to balance them as much as possible Excellent. Excellent. And keep in mind, everyone, that if you're not doing a, a decent job of monitoring your physical and mental state, that's going to have an adverse effect on your enforcement of your boundaries or your ability to stick to a plan or even to plan your day. And so this activity number five, well, these are all mission critical, but this is one that is going to have a strong impact on others on the list. David, it's well, interesting doesn't, that, doesn't that put you down in power apathy, T? Well, yeah, when we look at the results, yeah. you'll see that puts me down in power apathy. And so uh, we'll, when we do the debrief, we'll talk about how that could be something that is good, but how it's also a bit of a double-edged sword and sometimes it might not be serving you well at all. So right. can I do it? Yeah. Is it difficult to do it? No. Does that mean I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it well? That's what we'll discuss on the interpretation sessions that follow this. Okay. It's um, interesting yeah. that the World Tough Organization has now categorized uh, burnout as a um, you know, health condition that can be treated. And its definition of it is mental and emotional fatigue, like exhaustion. Um, yeah. And yeah. now it has an ICD code where you can actually be treated you know, from physician for burnout. I don't know what they prescribe for that per se, but yeah, it's not I mean that's really interesting. Condition. 
that they're that they're saying it's physical and emotional. Of course, when we're talking about uh, change management, tension management, or the roles of uh, the different levels of tension, we're all we say that tension is defined as the level of physical emotional and intellectual activity mm -hmm. there is a cognitive element to this whole thing and Absolutely. yes it's my thoughts that are ultimately going to lead me to particular behavior so we always talk about how whatever beliefs you hold uh, uh, whatever your emotional state happens to be, these are going to give rise to certain sorts of behaviors. And so if my mental state isn't right, maybe it's because I'm intellectually overwhelmed. Maybe mm -hmm. there's a lot of burden being placed on me to figure something out. Uh, and uh, that all, all by itself can be a huge contribution to your overall level of productive tension or and, uh, obviously impacting your perceptions around this as well. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let's go on to number six. Activity number six, creating an environment that minimizes interruptions and maximizes productivity. Well, maybe just maybe in order for you to accomplish these goals and let all these other activities we've talked about already do the best job they can for you, you need to make sure you've got the right environment uh, that you're going to be working in or performing in. So for example, it's interesting how many people in our uh, very, um, what do we say, technology um, laced life, try to use a place like Starbucks as their office. And I just think like, well, what kind of an environment is that? Does that minimize interruptions? Does that maximize productivity? If you're not in the right environment, then whatever it is you are doing could be taking far longer than it needed to take. And so I think it's really important for everyone to recognize that there exists a certain set of conditions under which you will be optimally productive. Those conditions can vary from one individual to the next. So you need to get, go back to the oracle of the self. You need to have a conversation with yourself. Let your truth be spoken. So you can say, no, for me to really do get the most out of me, really do the best job of managing my time, my resources, myself, I need to make sure that I've got the right environment for that to be done. And so creating an environment. Now, when it comes to how big of a job is it to create that environment? Well, uh, when you first set it all up, maybe it's, uh, I would say, pro was probably an eight. Uh, it was a big task, it took a day, you know, I needed to clean my environment. For me, uh, uh, the right environment is an environment that's clean and quiet, that's been well designed for the work that I'm trying to do. And so when I first did that, created that environment, yeah, it certainly um, was a bit of a task. Now, maintaining that environment <laughs> feels the exact same <laughs> because, you know, clutter happens and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff goes on. So what's my ability to create the environment that I need? My ability is at least a solid solid 10, maybe even more, but I always like to leave some room for important. The challenge of creating that environment, um, it really isn't all that challenging. There are no obstacles in my way of doing it other than the obstacles that I bring along in myself. And so I think I would say that creating that environment might be... Mm, maybe an eight, maybe a nine, I'm going to give it an eight. And the importance of doing it, I think it's important enough, I'm going to give it a 10. Uh, obviously, even in a world uh, where I don't have an ideal environment, I can still get some stuff done. So, um, but I'm going to say it's really, pardon me, quite important. Any thoughts, any of you guys would like to share on the subject of creating that environment? Nope. All right. Let's look at number seven. Now, this is a big one. Controlling distractions associated with my use of technology. And so this is about your relationship with your phone, with whatever platforms you use online, with whatever social media you expose yourself to, controlling distractions associated with my use of technology. It could even be something, those of you that are wearing wearable uh, fitness apps um, that are going to beep when you're doing this and uh, vibrate when you're doing that or whatever, these are all forms of technology and they in and of themselves can represent a whole 
whole range of distractions. Just can say no. <laughs> yeah, go right ahead, Brian. What did we say there? Just say, just say no. <laughs> just, well, we're getting to that one for sure. So my ability to control distractions, oh, what can I say? Working on the internet is part and parcel to everything that I do. And so I'm always on that. And how often do you, are you presented with something you could click on that really grabs your attention, but then you go like, oh, should I click on it or not, blah, blah, blah. So the distractions, I'm going to say the size of that task feels really big because it's ever present. Um, my ability to control those distractions, I wish I could say it was stronger, but I'm just going to give myself a six on that. Um, I am someone who finds myself, when I say, letting myself go off on, you know, going deep dives into the rabbit hole, etc. The challenge for me of controlling those distractions with my use of technology is absolutely an 11. Uh, I might even be tempted to give it a 12. For whatever reason, I find it extremely challenging to not get sucked into technology. And certainly I understand that, uh, that this is something that's becoming increasingly problematic across our entire society. And I know that it has a very strong connection to our quest for dopamine. And so when I go down that rabbit hole, when I scroll through whatever, I know that one way or another, I'm feeding my addiction for dopamine. So the importance of controlling it, I'm going to give that one a 12. I think that particularly in this day and age and with, uh, with our younger generations and all that, this is probably one of the largest issues that they are confronted by when it comes to personal productivity. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would agree. I always talk about the difference between homeostasis um, and allostasis. So when you're overloaded and overwhelmed, and right now we're at a point where this technology, you know, they call them tools. Yeah. And I always say, like, I have a tool set in my closet, but it does not have pings and notifications <laughs> from me. Right? Yeah. So right, yeah. you're not intentional with like how you interact with it right, and it's, right, right. it's quite difficult for me and i know this but it's still quite difficult because you know i have a deep curiosity so there's lots of things i want to learn mm -hmm. but you can't learn everything in one day well right so and, so if you don't add, have an intentional design to it it's just going to be a, a ever-present distraction right and add to that that the way many 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 of these uh, technological marvels have been engineered they are engineered to not only bring you in, but to keep you in. Right. So it becomes very, very challenging uh, over time for, uh, for someone to notice that it's a problem and break free of that problem. Uh, so when it comes to something like managing your time and energy, this use of technology is something that is truly mission critical. Mm -hmm. All right. So now let's move to the next one which is along the same lines, but it's more old school than it is modern technology. And that is managing creative avoidance to ensure I focus on high impact tasks that align with my primary goals. The, the real task is managing creative avoidance. Now, for those of you who have not given much thought to creative avoidance, creative avoidance is when you come up with things that on the surface seem like a good use of your time and you choose to do them, but underlying your choice to do it is that you didn't want to do what really needed to be done to begin with. And so you are avoiding doing those more, what I say, high impact tasks, as I said in there, uh, but rather than just being lazy and doing nothing or getting lost in your use of technology, no, you're coming up with very creative things that in and of themselves have value, but nevertheless are serving right now as a tool for avoidance of what you want to do. So for example, you may know that you need to take care of whatever the issue happens to be, but you're going to do your email first, you know, or you know that you need to take care of something going on in your life, but you know what, uh, I should probably put together a grocery list. It's like, okay, these things 
yes, they have a certain value to them. They're very random. They're just really evidence that there is some reason why you're trying to avoid doing whatever it is that needs to be done. And there are a lot of reasons why you might be avoiding it, but you're just being really creative coming up with reasons or activities that allow you to avoid whatever needs to be done. Uh, so when it comes to managing creative avoidance, well, stepping into the confessional, I'm going to give myself an eight for that one. That's a big deal. I am the king of creative avoidance. You, you look for one way to avoid doing something, I can give you 10. So my ability to manage creative avoidance is actually decent. I'll give myself an eight for that. But the challenge is very, very high. Um, and again, this isn't about, about, again, just a reminder for everyone, it's not about your personality. It's not about the essential you. This is a snapshot of a psychological moment in time. This is me exploring me right now. So remember that the change grid is called the Oracle of the Self, and it reflects conversations that you are having with you about you when it comes to whatever the activity is that you happen to be looking at. So creative avoidance for me, managing my creative avoidance is very high. Uh, the challenge of it is very high. I'm going to give it an 11, might even bordering on a 12. The importance of, uh, of managing my creative avoidance, I have to say, is becoming increasingly, increasingly important. So I'm going to give that one an actual 12 for me right now. Okay, so thoughts about managing creative avoidance. David, you're unmuted. Something you want to throw in? Well, you are certainly upgrade. You're all over the uh, change grid in this uh, 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 series of uh, tasks. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you're way upgrade on that one. Yeah, if we have time, uh, when our by the time our, our call is over right now, uh, I'm going to maybe I'll show you guys my results. So you can see what you'll be receiving when you fill out your profile. Um, okay, activity number nine: saying no to non-essential tasks and requests that do not align with my core goals. Just the saying no is the mission critical part. <laughs> so, uh, how good are you at saying no to begin with? Now, interestingly enough, for me, saying no is a very tiny task. I'll give it a two, maybe it should be a one. My ability to do it is super solid. I'll give it at least an 11. Again, I'm always hesitant to give myself a 12 for ability because I don't really think that any of us are truly masters of much of anything. And so I always wanna leave a little room for me to do that, but I definitely have the ability to say no. The challenge of saying no for me is not very high at all. I might give it, you know, I try to be, um, diplomatic if I turn a request down, you know, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or anything like that. So maybe I'll give the challenge. Mm, you can see I'm debating right now between a four and a five. Eh, I'm going to give it a four. It's just not all that challenging. And the importance of doing it, I'm going to say is at least a nine. Sometimes maybe I didn't need to say no. I'm thinking thinking back over prior prior uh, prior situations. So is it really important to say no? No, I've got it. No, I'm changing that. I need to, I'm gonna move it up to a 10. <laughs> All right. So I'll throw this to all of you guys. What do you think about saying no to non-essential tasks? So with your the way you just rated this particular activity, would that mean that number eight for you, or would that indicate number eight for you as kind of um, uh, some kind of release? Because you have the capacity to say, no, I don't want to participate in creative avoidance. I don't want to. Yeah. Yeah, I think what I'm doing when I'm talking about managing creative avoidance, that to me feels like more of an internal kind of a, a, a situation, you know, it's about um, me coming up with things. And I do find that very, very challenging to, to manage that. I, I can come up with plenty of things. When it comes to saying no, I just say no reflexively. I will tell you that in my daily life, the answer that you're likely to hear from me is no. Um, unless I, uh, you know, have given a good, a good reason to do it. So I almost think that me uh, saying no is more of a reflex. Got it. You know? Got it. So to me, yeah. I do feel there's a big difference between these two. Number eight are things that I'm doing. 
And number nine is just me having this reflexive um, d desire to not be involved, to, to withdraw or whatever. And again, uh, I know I've said this several times, this is really important. This is not me as a person. Right. This is me as a moment in time. Right now, this is what I'm going through. Now, number 10. Let's take a look. Oh, wait, I got a lot of people on mute there. No, no, no. You guys, Kathy, what do you want to share there? Yeah, yeah I, I was going to say, I think that's a really important distinction, internal versus external. Um, here, I see nine as external. Yeah, it really like deriving, is. Deriving externally. I, I, you know, I might have some different responses that, that you might have, but they're both difficult for me either yeah. way. Yeah, but and yeah. To, to Brian's point, it really is difficult for me to say no to my own creative avoidance choices. <laughs> so honestly, it rarely occurs to me to say no to it. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, after the fact, yeah, the whole world of coulda, shoulda, wouldas. Yeah, I realized that creative avoidance ends up equaling a tremendous waste of time and energy, no forward movement happening. And so should I have said no? Yes. Did I say no? Apparently not to myself. And again, remember the whole point of filling out a ChangeWorks profile is for you to have an understanding of where you're at right now. When we start going through the interpretation sessions and those of you who might be working with uh, a, uh, a coach or uh, a therapist of one sort or another, there's a whole lot that the change grid is going to reveal that would be good things for you to explore in deeper detail with whoever it is you explore things in deeper detail with. And so uh, there, there you go. So uh, number 10, managing the expectations and responsibilities I place upon myself. Ah, That's that, a good one. That feels like a big task for me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give that one probably a 10. I mean, I'm even attempted to give it an 11. It's big. It's overwhelming at times. My ability to manage those expectations and responsibility, I have to say, right now, the way I'm feeling, it's pretty low. It's pretty low. Um, yeah, I might even give it a two. The challenge of doing it, uh, I'll tell you, feels very much like uh, 10 and 11 maybe even a 12, I'll give it an 11. No, I'm giving it a 12. And the importance of managing those expectations, I would like to say is top of mind for me, but I don't seem to really be doing it. And so I'll still rate it as a high for the importance thing. No, it really is important. I'll give it an 11. So you guys are hearing me. Now, again, as I do this and I'm thinking out loud, I hope you guys recognize that this may very well be your own process when you're filling out the change grid for yourself. The important part of the change grid is really about the conversation you're having with yourself as you fill this out. And what my conversation with myself right now about these managing the expectations and responsibilities, I would say to you, I do feel overwhelmed and I do feel stressed by a lot of what's happening um, in my reality right now. And so just being as, as candid as I can be, as authentic as, as I can be, this really is managing the expectations and responsibilities I place upon myself. I think I've put a lot of expectation responsibilities on myself that are not necessary, that I do not really want, but, one way or another, they're part of what I perceive as my current reality. Uh, thoughts about activity number 10? Anyone? Yeah, want to I'm, I'm with you on that one. Yeah, I feel the same. Uh, my scores would be probably quite similar at this point because there's so much going on and the overwhelm, the sheer overwhelm from it sometimes is almost... Uh, I won't say unbearable exactly, but it's it's like to me it's getting to that point. Right. In which case, is it any surprise that we would be doing a lot of things that are creative avoidance? Uh, we would be not doing a very good job about uh, controlling the distractions with technology. It's this feeling that um, I'm just 
overwhelmed. The expectations are so great, but the expectations are not being imposed upon me by anything outside of me. This is just me. And I don't mind sharing that with everyone who's watching these videos because I know that there is a great part of the population out there who is feeling and living these kinds of things all day, every day. Mm -hmm. The way the, that we're ever going, if we're ever going to have any positive impact on it is that we have to be able to recognize and accept the truth of where we are. Once we know where we are, then we can make an informed decision about what we want to change and then pursue how we go about making those changes, which is going to get us all the way back to activity number one. What are your core goals? Because apparently it's not the stuff that's got you bogged down from, you know, number 10 or whatever the case may be, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So T, what's your favorite downgrade beverage? Oh, I only drink water. Well, That's... I'm going to sit in a quiet, dimly lit place with you with a pitcher of water and two glasses and have this conversation. Well, and there you are. This is the kind of stuff you get. One of the things that I, I hope everyone gets out of their experience with the change grid is that there is nothing in the change grid that is etched in stone. Everything about it is in constant motion because this is all about managing your perceptions. The problem is that if you don't manage your perceptions, your perceptions are going to manage you. Mm -hmm. and so we need to decide at a certain point in time that I'm ready, willing, and able to accept the me that I am right now. Uh, so that I can go about, again, exploring that in more detail, understanding it, making some decisions, owning some truths, so that I can really follow through and do some of the things that may very well be able to turn my perceptions around 180 degrees. Right. That's one of the things I value about the grid itself is not like a personality uh, assessment that says this is who you are. Yep. Right. And then, then you wear that label. Right. Uh, this is just simply saying this is how you're perceiving that particular situation at the moment. And there's to your point, there's reasons underscoring that as to sure. why. That's right. And so we can do, but again, the change grid, the reason why we want people to do the self-assessment is so you know where you're starting from. Then as we work our way through the interpretation sessions, we can get into a deep discussion about how would you go about having a positive impact on each of these mission critical activities. And that's where the real change work can begin. But it all starts by understanding where you're at right now and just owning it. So just be honest with yourself as you fill it all out. Don't try to put down the right answer because the right answer doesn't exist. Um, and the only person that you would be lying to is yourself, in which case we need to add another activity. Stop lying to yourself. <laughs> all right. Number 11. Number 11, building resilience to overcome challenges and setbacks in my pursuits. Now, resilience is something that uh, is going to change like so many of these other things, depending on where you are in life, what's happening right now, other variables that are coming into play. There could be physical things going on, emotional things going on, intellectual things that are going on that are putting you into a whole different scenario. But whatever that scenario happens to be, it would behoove you to develop some resilience some ability to bounce back uh, to uh, whatever it is that happens to be going on. So this is about handling those uh, issues that are not plotting in their most ideal location. Can, are you resilient enough to overcome those challenges and setbacks? Or are you so rigid that you're just going to become a victim of them? So building that resistance is really something that you've done all of your life and you need to continue to do for the rest of your life. How big of a task does it feel like it is for me to build that resilience? I think the task is a, is a pretty big one. I'll give it a 10. My ability to build that resilience, I know that I have the ability to do it, but I'm not going to, to polish the apple any. I'll give myself a nice eight for that one. How challenging is it for me to do that? Mm, the way I'm feeling right now, I'm going to give that a 10. And the importance of doing it, I think, is really up there. I'll give myself an 11 uh, for, for the importance. Thoughts about this one? 
building resilience. No, oh, I think that's an incredibly important one. And I would answer it. I mean, I would answer it similarly to how you do right now, because I'm in that state of transition. Yeah. Um, and at different times in my life, I'd answer that differently. But that's boy, right. right now, yeah, I'd, I'd be right there with you on all of that's those. Right. That's right. And again, for everyone who's, who's uh, watching this video, listening to our dialogue here, the changes we're talking about can happen over the course of a matter of minutes. Don't think that wherever you're plotting right now is the way you're going to be plotting for X amount of time into the future. Just the right insight delivered at just the right time or the right uh, tool being introduced at just the right time can change your world dramatically and very quickly. And so, but this is where I'm at, at this very moment. Uh, and so uh, we're, you know, I'll accept my starting point from wherever I am. Um, all right, and again, just to, to really ring this point home, because I'm the person who created this tool, I want you to know if I wanted these results to plot uh, for, for my, my answers to plot in the ideal locations, you all know I have the ability to do that, but to what outcome, to what benefit? I have to be willing to be honest with myself as I work my way through this work of change work. And that gets us to the last one. And that's surrounding myself with people who support me in reaching my goals. When it comes to surrounding myself with people, that is a big task because the kind of people that will really do the most genuine job of supporting you are not, um, available in a grand multitude, <laughs> you know, it's not. It takes work to find the right people, to cultivate those relationships. And by the way, that gets us back to the last um, life situation we looked at, which was about building relationships that truly matter. And so if, you're, if this is the first exploration you've done, this is exploration number six. There are five other explorations we've already completed, and those are all up online for you guys to pursue at your leisure. Each one of them has its own ChangeWorks profile associated with it, and multiple hours of interpretation sessions and action planning uh, that's up there for all of you to benefit from absolutely free. So, so do check it out. But anyway, I would say that really surrounding yourself with those kinds of people, that's a pretty big challenge. I'm going to give it a nine. My ability to do it is strong. I'm going to give it a 10, maybe even an 11. Nah, I'll stick with 10. The challenge of doing it is also, I'm going to say, pretty high. I'll give it a nine. I do think I figured it all out. The importance of doing it, very important. I'll give it a 10 for that. And so, we're talking about surrounding yourself with those people. I mean, even having uh, the uh, the ChangeWorks community, this is an action that's involved in surrounding myself with people who support me in reaching our goals. All of you who participate in the Oracle of the Self calls, I can only imagine that one of the reasons you share in common is that you believe you're part of a community of people who are ready, willing, and able to support you in whatever way they can to help you become the best you you can be. That's what this community is really all about. So hopefully you guys are experiencing that as you participate on these calls. And those of you that are watching uh, this as a video know that that community does exist. And uh, it, by the way, becoming a member of the community is free. You just go to Patreon and you you know fill it out and you're automatically at least a free member so you can do that you can something that you can actually pretty easily do um any thoughts comments uh about this particular activity yeah i find this one particularly it gets challenging the more um apps and technology come out like what you just said about this these calls is important for me and i get greater um or feel more at, uh, comfortable here than like in a LinkedIn kind of way where, you know, there's gazillion contacts and people are doing things for clicks and likes. I don't get anything out of that. Uh, relationships mean a lot more to me than having a gazillion friends that I'm not connected to. And the fact that I'm calling them friends and can't yeah. reach out to them in time of need, that, that seems too superficial. And I think we're at a point where people get to hide behind technology mm -hmm. and the, the real connections to your point, in my opinion, takes time. Right. 
Well, and that's why we do live calls. You know, I do a variety of calls every week. I hope that one aspect of the value of those calls is the community that it actually ends up offering uh, for people to do. Um, anywho, to finish this off, all you do is click on finish the change grid and you will then get a little note that says your change grid has been completed. Thanks so very much. And within a matter of minutes, you should receive your results in, the, uh, in your email. Uh, we will begin our, next our first interpretation call on this subject by looking at what your results might actually look like. And then we'll have discussions on each activity to give you guys some insights, some tools, techniques, uh, some options on how you could go about having the most positive impact you can on each one of those um, those mission critical activities. So any final thoughts, comments? Have a good day, Ferg. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, T. I thought that was extremely helpful for you to I'm walk. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Thanks, everybody. All right. Take care. We'll talk again soon. Have Bye, a good everyone. day, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.